telling, uh, I forget who I was, I was telling, but I like to try to get through this study tonight. We, uh, we looked at cameos of Christ. In other words, things about Jesus. And by the way, we're trying to do what Jesus told us to do. He said, learn of me, didn't he? And uh, so we looked at the face of Jesus, our first study. The second study was we looked at the head of Jesus. Then we looked at the mind of Christ. That was our third study. And then tonight we're going to look at the shoulders of Christ. You say, well, strange to start out in Judges, but I want to make a comparison here. In Judges chapter 16, let's look at verses 1, 2, and 3. And uh, let's pray first, and then we'll uh, get into our study. Our Father, tonight we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to meet in this place and to pray collectively and individually. And we thank you, Lord, that we can open up our Bibles and uh, study your word. We pray now that tonight that you would help us to see uh, the shoulders of your son, Jesus. In Christ's name we pray and for his sake we pray. Amen. Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there in Harlot or Gaza. You heard that one before, haven't you? That word. There a harlot went in unto her, and it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson is come hither, and they compassed him in, and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city, and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson lay till midnight, and arose at midnight, and took the doors of the gates, or the gate, took the doors of the gate of the city, and the two posts, and went away with them bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of an hill that is before Hebron. Now, though Samson is never, listen, Samson, I don't care what any commentary may say, Samson is never a type of Jesus Christ. Never. God forbid that he would ever be a type of Jesus. You know what Samson was? Samson was a whoremonger. That's exactly what he was. So he can never be a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what he did here in carrying the gate of the city, post, the Bible says, bar and all, pictures our Lord's completeness of salvation for lost sinners. Now what Jesus did at Calvary, he completed it. He did it all. He never left anything undone. Amen? Samson bore the gates bar and all, but Jesus did not leave one sin unatoned for at Calvary. We sing the song, don't we? Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. So Samson bore the gates bar and all. He didn't leave anything out of that. And so we see in comparison, not that Jesus was a type, not that Samson was a type of Jesus, but what Jesus did at Calvary in that he bore all of our sins in his body on the tree. He never left anything out, never left anything undone. That's why you're saved forever. Because if there was one sin that he overlooked, <laughs> then we'd be in trouble. But he never overlooked any of it. He paid it all. Thank God for that. So I think about man. Man's always leaving something undone. How many of you got something to do? How many of you think you'll have it to do next week? Amen. Now, how many of you just keep putting it off? Right? Yeah, so. Now look, <laughs> Jesus, Jesus never left anything undone. Man does. We leave, look, I got stuff to do. I got tons of stuff to do. You say, you, you say you'll ever get it done? No. It's like this, when, when you think you're beating a rat race, somebody throws in a fresh rat. But you, know, you never get anything done. Jesus finished everything he came to do. Thank the Lord for that. He finished preaching what he needed to preach. He, he finished healing those he needed to heal. He went to Calvary and finished the work that, G, that God, his father, called him to do on Calvary. He finished it. I can think of one other person that maybe did everything that God wanted him to do. And left nothing undone. The Apostle Paul says, what? I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Didn't he? He, he said that. There was one, three things he said. Remind me. I fought a good fight. Yeah. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. And then he was looking for that crown, wasn't he? Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of rejoicing. And so, look. Uh, I think of all the people that I know about, 
in the scriptures, always somebody left something undone except for the Lord Jesus and possibly the apostle Paul. So Jesus always finished what he set out to do. Well, the Bible tells us that he turned the water into wine. He did not turn water into a mixture of water and wine. It was pure wine. When he turned the water into wine, it was pure wine. When Jesus, when Jesus calmed the sea, remember he walked on the water, got into the boat after, after he took Peter, uh, pulled him out from drowning and went on the boat. And then, and then the Bible says he calmed the sea. But the, Bible did, but the Bible puts it this way. When he calmed the sea, there was a great calm. It just didn't have a few little ripples and things. It was, I, I would imagine it was just like, like a sea of glass. It was just as smooth as it could be. Because Jesus is that way. He does things perfectly. By the way, when he healed, when he healed somebody, the Bible says that they were perfectly whole. Perfectly whole. And so we find out that man's always leaving something undone, but Jesus never does. Now turn to Colossians, if you would, because not only Jesus forgave sins, he put them away. He put them away. And I like this verse in Colossians chapter number two, because you can see the picture here I'm about to show you that God shows you rather. In Colossians chapter number two, if you'll look at verse number 14. Now this is a picture of him on the cross, all right? It says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now, when they would crucify a person, they would, they would write down the crimes he had committed or she had committed, and they would nail them up above their head on the cross. So that when somebody came by and saw that, that so-called criminal on that cross, they could read what he had done to be crucified. The only thing they could put about Jesus was what? This is Jesus, King of the Jews. That was the only crime that they could come up with him. Now, they could blame him for a lot of things, and they did, but none of them stuck. Pilate says, what I have written, I have written. But look what he says here in verse number 14. The Bible says, Bl blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. You know what he's saying here? He's saying that we should have been crucified because here's what we were. Sinners. And we, I mean, look, there were a ton of things you could put on our piece of paper if we were nailed to the cross. But the Bible says that Jesus, thank God for this now, the Bible says that Jesus took that out of the way and he did what with it? He nailed it to his cross. The Bible says he became sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So everything that was against us, Jesus took it out of the way. By the way, he blotted it out first. Thank God for that. You ever try to read something through blood? Can't do it. And I'm telling you what, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Not only he blotted our sins uh, out. Not only he forgave our sins, but he took them out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So thank God that he not only forgave our sins, but he put it away. Verse number 15, it says, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So not only his shoulders speak of complete salvation, but look at Luke chapter number 15. Let's move on to the next one. Now, I'd like to get through these tonight. How many of you would give me extra minutes? <laughs> How many extra minutes? A minute here, a minute there, a minute there. Okay. I thought that was pretty good. I'll have to call Eric and say, man, I like that. I'm going to. Luke chapter number 15. Luke chapter number 15. All right, let's look at verse number three. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. Now, not only his shoulders pictured in Judges for complete salvation, but here we have the sheep on his shoulders for safety. Now, you know what religion does 
Religion does this. When somebody goes astray, they won't go after them unless they want their money. I heard of, I heard of a, 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 just a couple of weeks ago, I heard of a pastor that came into this church and the church didn't have a pastor, so they wanted him as pastor. He took, uh, he took the checkbook and uh, made his wife the assistant treasurer. <laughs> and he kept record of who gave, who didn't give. And if you didn't tithe, he went to your house and tried to collect it. <laughs> By the way, let me tell you something. This was in a Baptist church. I can name the fellow and I can name the church, but I'm not going to do that. But I'm telling you what, that's what religion does. If you don't do what religion wants you to do, you're ostracized or you're, um, you're, you're put out to pasture, so to speak. But Jesus is not like that. The Bible says that all we like sheep have done what? We've gone astray. You say, you mean the Bible says some, like, no, it says all, we, like sheep. You know, sheep pretty smart, aren't they? No, they're one of the dumbest animals in all this world. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. You know, my question is, why would God's sheep, why would people who are saved, when they know they ought to be in church, when they know Look, when they know that went, while they were in church, while they were serving God, things might have been a little bit tough, but they're tough for everybody. But while you're in the house of God and you're serving God, isn't life so much better than being out in the hell holes of this world? Amen. It's so much better, but why do they do that? Why do they go, to, go astray? Because they're dumb, <laughs> just like sheep. I did the same thing. And I wish some preacher had come by and said, you dummy, why don't you get back in church? <laughs> but I had the Holy Spirit to say, boy, you're really making waves, aren't you? <laughs> I'm telling you what, the Holy Spirit will talk to you and speak to your heart like nobody else can. Amen. And uh, so here, here's a picture of religion. There's no love in religion, you know that. You know what you have in religion? You have rules and you have regulations and you have judgments and you have uh, unforgiveness, but you have no love. It was love that caused this shepherd to go after the sheep. He could have said, you know what? I've got 90 and 9 that needs my love. He could have said that, but he didn't. He said, I've got one out there that really needs my love and I'm going after it. And so the pursuit of the Redeemer, love goes after the lost sheep or the lost sinner sheep. As I said, Isaiah 53 are, are dumb, will follow anything, and they get in great danger. Luke chapter 15, we're there, but let's go to John chapter number 10. Not too far. John chapter number 10, verse number 4. I love this great chapter. John chapter 10, verse number 4. Boy, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that God left us a Bible. I really am. And when he put forth his own sheep, verse number four, John 10, four. And when he put forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Let's look down to verse number seven. Jesus saith, then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Then he says in verse 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Who is the thief? The devil is, isn't he? He says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sheep, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. There's no love there, is there? No. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. Religion don't care about people, but Jesus does. 
I am the good shepherd, know my sheep, and am known of mine. Now, we see then the position of the returned sheep. When he goes after the one that left the foal, when he goes after the one that went astray, where do we find that sheep? We find him placed up on the shoulders of the shepherd. Now, I want you to think about this. Back in Luke chapter number 15, he's on his shoulders for protection and safety. Now, thank God when wandering sheep return, there, there, there are some who return on their own. Thank God for that. But I'm going to tell you, most of them have to be carried back after being chastened of the Lord. Some commentators or some shepherds will actually say to keep that sheep from going astray, you know what they do? They break their legs. They break that sheep's legs to keep it from going astray. Yeah. They'll carry that sheep. They'll tend for that sheep until that sheep heals up. And it'll think twice about wandering off. You know what God has to do sometimes? Sometimes he has to chasten us to keep us from wandering off. Now, remember, I said something about love being involved in the whole process. Look at verse number four. In verse four, I'm going to go through these real quick. There's seven things real quickly that I want you to look at. Number one, there's love's loss. Love's loss. The Bible says it's if he lose one of them. And then verse number four, love's activity. Activity, he goes after that which is lost. He, didn't say, he doesn't say, oh, my soul, I love that sheep. I loved him. He was a pretty good sheep. <laughs> no, he goes after him. If you love something, there's an active force behind love. People say, I love this or I love that. Man, I love hot dogs. I'm not going to look at pictures of them. I'm going to eat one. <laughs> say amen right there. Had about five so far, hadn't I? <laughs> anyway, love's persistency, verse number four, until he find it. He goes after that sheep until he finds it. Now, do you think he just happened to come upon it? I think there was a great search made. Persistency. Then love's provision in verse number five. And when he had found it, he laid it on his shoulders, doing what? Which is love's joy. And verse number six talks about that joy. And then love's consummation. I mean, what does that mean? That means, uh, what does he do with it? He, he, count, he takes it home. He takes it home. You know, one day we're going home. <laughs> I'm not talking about going home after this message. I'm talking about one day we're going home. We're going home because God loves us so much that he sent our great shepherd to die for the sheep. And he did that. And then love's fellowship in verse number six. I like that. When he cometh home, he calleth together his friends, neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Now, we, so we have the burden upon his shoulders pictured in uh, Samson carrying off the gates for salvation. Then we have sheep on the shoulders for safety. But let's go now to Isaiah chapter number nine. You were waiting on that one, right? Let's go to Isaiah nine. Let's see what we have here. And I think you know this one. Isaiah chapter number nine. And if you look at verse number six. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, government upon his shoulder, not shoulders. Did you notice that? Just one shoulder, he says. Government upon his shoulder pictures the sovereignty of God. Now, let me just say this. Sovereignty is not a Bible word, but it's a pretty good word. In fact, you'll never find the word Bible in the Bible, but aren't you glad you have a Bible? Yeah. Right? I am. Now, it means, here's what sovereignty means. It means supreme power. Now, listen. When people say, I don't understand why God lets this happen or lets that happen or lets what's happening in Israel. Why does he let all that happen? Well, simply, he's not king on this earth yet. He's not sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem. If he was, none of this would be happening. So he's, he, he's sovereign. He has sovereign. He has supreme power, the possession of the highest power 
or of uncontrollable power. There's nobody that is able to control God's power. I think it's in the book of Job. It says, who hath hardened himself against God and hath prospered? You can blame God for anything, everything you want to, but it's not going to make him less powerful. He's all powerful. Now, notice again, it's only one shoulder that's mentioned. It takes two shoulders to carry or bear our sins away. It takes two shoulders to carry back the lost or the wandering sheep. But here he's just using one shoulder. And I want you to think about this. Look what he says here in verse number six. For unto us a child is born. That's the son of man. For unto us a son is given. That's the son of God. But then look what he says. The government shall be upon his shoulders. That's the son of David. Now think about this for just a minute. Jesus in various places is called the son of David. You remember, was it the lepers or or somebody had some kind of disease, they would cry out to him, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus is known as the son of David in Luke chapter number one. But turn with me now to Isaiah chapter 22. This goes along with what we're talking about right here in Isaiah nine. But look at Isaiah chapter number 22 and verse number 21. Now we talked about the government's gonna be up on his shoulder, Right? Now, verse 21, chapter 22 of Isaiah, verse 21. And I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit the, thy government into his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. Single, singular. So he shall open and none shall shut and he shall shut and none shall open and I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house and they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity from the vessels of cups, even all the vessels of flagons, flagons. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed and be cut down and fall. The burden that was upon it shall be cut off for the Lord hath spoken it. Now, I, th this talks about his dominion, his dominion. The government's going to be up on his shoulder. Now, hold your place there and we'll come back, but turn to the book of Numbers chapter 11. Numbers 11, and let's take a, quick look at Moses for just a second. Now we'll come back to Isaiah 9, but look at uh, Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. All right, verse number 11. Numbers 11 and verse number 11, and we're looking at Moses here. Numbers 11, 11. Are we there? And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight? Now, now look at this. Here's what Moses is saying to God, asking God. That thou layest a burden of all this people upon me. Verse 14. I am not able to bear this people alone because it is too heavy for me. But you know what? When Jesus takes seat upon the throne of David, all the people that he has to govern is not going to be too much for him. Because number one, when we go back to Isaiah chapter number nine, Isaiah chapter nine, let's look at four things about this government. Let me get back over where I was. First of all, it's going to be an increasing government, an increasing government. Well, you know, those of... <laughs> You know, I, I have to say this, that those people that are invading our country illegally, they're coming in thinking that they've got a better place to live. Man, it's just getting worse all the time. Yes. They'll be, ended up, they'll be in, <laughs> ending up going back to their own country thinking, you know what, we had it better back in our old land. <laughs> but people who 
Look, there was a time when people were flocking to America because it's such a great place to live. And I think it still is. But here he's talking about an increase of his government. An increasing of his government. Verse number seven. Of the increase of his government. You see, there's going to be, there's not just going to be a government up on his shoulder, but it's going to increase. It will be an orderly government. Look, he says, verse seven, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Now, who, who wouldn't want to live in a place where there's peace and righteousness? Surely we do. And look what he says. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth even forever. Look, look, it's going to be a rightful and a righteous government. It's going to be rightful because it belongs to the son of David, the Lord Jesus. It's going to be righteous because it's going to be established in order, justice, and judgment. Huh. And you won't be able to vote him out. Amen. You won't want to vote him out. And then it's going to be an everlasting government. Verse number seven, it says, from henceforth, even forever. And I like, it tells how. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And just think, all of this on one shoulder. <laughs> all of this on one shoulder. Now, let's look at the last thing now. All right, where are we going on this one? Exodus 28, let's go there. Exodus 28 and verse number 9. The government's going to be on his shoulder. All right, verse number 9. Exodus 28, verse 9. Verse 9 says, And thou shalt take two onyx stones and grave on them the names of the children of Israel. So how many names? Twelve. Right? One for each tribe, one a name for each tribe. Six of their names on one stone, and the other six names of the rest on the other stone according to their birth. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, shalt thou engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel. And thou shalt make them to be set in ouches of gold. And thou shalt put the two stones upon the Shoulders of the ephod for stones of memorial unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. Now, Aaron, the high priest, is going to carry the names of every tribe, 12 of them, of Israel upon his shoulders. Our High priest, the Lord Jesus, carries our names too. In fact, when it's all over with, he's going to give us a brand new name. Let's go to Hebrews. In fact, look at verse 12. It's, it's, we just read that. Aaron shall bear names before the Lord upon his shoulders for a memorial. Now, we're going to go to Hebrews and, and switch back and forth here, okay? So Hebrews chapter number 2. And I want you to look at a word. That goes right along with what we're talking about. Hebrews chapter number 2. And Jesus is our high priest. Remember, he's able to do something. And I'm going to point that word out to you. Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 18. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor. That's the way you pronounce that word, succor. To succor them that are tempted. Now, the word sucker, the word literally means to run to or run to support. It means to help, to relieve when in difficulty, want, or distress. It means to assist and deliver from suffering. Now, we have such a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. He doesn't say those people, that guy, that lady, he knows us by name. And we can call out to him. And the Bible says, as our high priest, he'll come running. He is able to deliver us. He is able to relieve us in difficulty. And thank God he has, and he's going to continue to do so. Because we belong to him. So we have 
his name, we have names on his shoulders, but back over in uh, Exodus 28, names are somewhere else. Verse number 29, Exodus 28, look at verse number 29. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon, upon his heart. Now he says over in, in verse 12, 12, upon his shoulders, and here he says upon his heart, when he goeth into the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. You know what the difference is? That Aaron, the high priest, was the only one that could go into the holy place but we, as God's children, can come. We're invited to go boldly to the throne of grace ourselves. We can go right into the throne room because he bears our name. Not only on his shoulders, but on his heart. Now, here we see Jesus, not only is he, he suckers us, but he sympathizes with us. Hebrews chapter 4. Now, we're in Hebrews 2, right? But let's go to chapter 4, verse number 15. Verse number 15, Hebrews 4, 15, look. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. You know what religion's not, religion don't have any feelings for anybody. But Jesus does. We have an high priest. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, like as we are, yet without sin. So not only names on shoulders and high priests, Name upon the heart. But there's something here that when you look it up and you try to find what it means, it's very, very difficult. When you look at um, verse number 30, back over in Exodus chapter 28, verse number 30. Now verse 30. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord, how often? Continually. Now, here's what they had. Here's what the children of Israel had. They had what was called the Urim and the Thummim. <laughs> Try to say that real fast about 10 times. That's what they had. That's the first time it's mentioned. It was right here. And I think the last time it's mentioned is somewhere in Nehemiah 7 or so but nowhere else mentioned. They, what, what was that preacher? What was the Urim and the Thummim? Well, that's a good question because I cannot give you a definite answer. I can give you what I think it is. I can give you what some theories are, commentators say they are, but they were objects not specifically described. Perhaps maybe there were stones that were placed on the, on the uh, high priest's bre uh, breastplate they obviously were there, but when the high priest went into the presence of the Lord, he used it to ascertain the will of God. He used it to, uh, when it came to matters of great importance to the nation of Israel, it's uncertain what they were, it's uncertain what they looked like, it's even uncertain how they were used. You say, well, what, what's the, what are they for? Well, there's a couple of theories I'll throw at you. I can't prove them. You can't disprove them. But they were used as the lot being cast. Remember in the Bible, they were cast lots. It's sort of like drawing straws, isn't it? You ever draw straws? You ever throw dice? Now well, you're looking at me. Oh, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, you play board games. There's dice and everything. How come everybody, look, how come when I say you throw dice, you assume that you, I'm, I'm assuming that you're gambling for money? Well, maybe a couple of you do, but I'm just. But they were used sort of like that. They were short, sort of used like drawing straws or casting lots or, or sort of like throwing dice. And the manner of their fall, how they laid, was sort of like uh, that revealed God's will. Now, that's kind of dangerous, isn't it? But here's another theory. That's what, that's what some of them believe. But they would serve as a symbol on the high priest's authority to seek God's will, God's counsel, and God's will would be revealed to him through inner illumination. In other words, he would say, the priest would say, 
God contacted me from the Urim and the Thummim, and here's what he said. Now, that's kind of dangerous, too. So that's what they had. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you know what we have? We have the Holy Spirit, and we have the Holy Scriptures. We don't have to guess. We've got God's direction right here. Now, there's some things that you say, I just don't know what God wants me to do. Well, keep reading. Keep praying. Keep asking God. He'll show you. But don't you think it would be a poor thing if we had to rely upon the Urim and the Thummim today? We don't even know what it was. We don't know how it worked. We don't know what it looked like. There's an artist's conception of some, some of this stuff, but they don't know. But when God gave us his word, he gave us a completed revelation of what he wants us to know. And these verses are for believers and Jesus. By the way, let's go to Hebrews 7. Let's go to Hebrews. We'll, we'll close with this, okay? Hebrews chapter number 7. That's what they had, the Urim and the Thummim. But we have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Scriptures. Hebrews chapter number 7. Jesus, is, Jesus has an unchangeable priesthood. Now remember, those priests back in the Old Testament died, didn't they? Aaron died, remember that? But in verse number 24, he said, This man, but this man, that's Jesus, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make, it inter to make intercession for them. You say, well, that means that God will save anybody to the other. He's not talking about saving lost people here. He's talking about saving to them the uttermost. You know what? God has saved us from getting in trouble sometimes. God has saved us. In a, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm not talking about going to hell or anything like that. I'm talking about there's some things that the Holy Spirit deals with our heart through the Scripture, in our hearts and our minds. And haven't you had direction from God? You're getting ready to do something, go somewhere, and the Spirit of God just would deal with your heart or maybe through a scripture and say, you better not do that. And it's a good thing you didn't. You know, God still is in the saving business, saving his saved people. Isn't he our protector? Isn't he our provider? Yeah. Hasn't he saved us from a lot of heartache and a lot of trouble? Man, how many men or how many of women, young girls, young men have been saved from making the biggest mistake of their life and marrying the wrong person? Through maybe the counsel of a pastor, the scriptures or whatever. I mean, I'm telling you, he's still saving people. And here's where, here's where, I, where I know that he's not talking about lost people. Look what it says. Wherefore, he's able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. We come to God, don't we? By Jesus. Now look at this. Seeing he ever liveth to, maketh, to make intercession for them. Jesus never makes intercession for lost people. Just for saved people. Right? And when you get saved, then he makes intercession for you. So the shoulders of Jesus... The burden on his shoulders for salvation, the sheep on his shoulders for safety, the government on his shoulders, picturing the sovereignty of God, and the names upon his shoulders for security. Amen. I'm glad for the shoulders of Jesus. Now, next study, we're going to look at the arms of Jesus, the arms of Jesus. And there's quite a study right there on the arms of Jesus. So let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we're able to learn one more thing of thee, the shoulders, the everlasting shoulders, the protecting shoulders, the providing shoulders. Thank you, Father, for the study tonight. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we get excited about learning about Jesus. Father, if there's one here that does not know Christ as Savior, would you save them? Would you let them see that they were that lost sheep that went astray?
that we're not saved to start with, but that Jesus came to this old earth, lived a sinless life, died a vicarious death, cruel death, went to a cross, shed his blood for lost souls. And he came to save this and to seek and to save that which was lost. Have your way in the invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Nobody loves me like you love me, Jesus. I stand